morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining the Diana Initiative's 2022 remote conference. We want to thank all of our sponsors again for supporting us and helping us bring this conference to you. Before kicking off our keynote, we do want to highlight that if you do have any feedback for us and our speakers today, we'd love to hear from you. Please check out our Discord links for the survey. With our theme this year being Take the Initiative, I'm proud to introduce our keynote speaker, Maggie Mann. Maggie is a self-described career former sex worker, now working as a full spectrum doula and reproductive justice advocate. Maggie actively speaks in support of underrepresented communities and continues to be a voice in active outreach efforts. To learn more about our work, please check out our page at maggiemann.com. And now, Maggie. Hello, my name is Maggie Mayhem, and it is my pleasure to be here today for the Diana Initiative 2022. It has been my honor and my privilege to work with some of the people who made this conference possible in many capacities. I've been able to talk about sex worker rights, harm reduction, and other causes that are near and dear to my heart. When I received the invitation to be here today, however, I initially wanted to run away because how could I be the right person for this conference? I don't know anything about how to break into information security or any technical workplace. I don't know how to even get a job. I've been making my living as someone engaged in the erotic trades or in birth work and even death work. And I can tell you a little bit about that, but certainly not how to get a job in Silicon Valley or any other place that works with technology. I don't know how to pick locks. I don't know how to capture the flag. I can barely open my own email successfully. What could I have to offer to the people here at this conference today? Especially when I am in the company of so many experts who have so many things they can share about how to access these jobs and survive and support the people that you work with when you're there. What I can offer is a reminder of the power of your imagination and your capacity to take initiative on behalf of your own imagination in any workplace that you enter, no matter what it is and no matter what you do. I can tell you about the relationship that I've had to work and to labor and how that has changed over the years. While I don't have a roadmap for how to get into a workplace or what you might do exactly when you're there, I can remind you of the importance of you being there and the importance of you remembering that you are a human when you are there. The theme of taking initiative is something that I can speak to in a few ways and that I'm happy to speak to in a few ways because that's the kind of phrase that we might hear that can help us remain with a status quo that isn't serving us. To say take initiative implies taking action, but on behalf of what? What do we need to take initiative to do? What I would like to suggest is we should all be taking initiative for our own imagination and for the awareness of the way that the circumstances we face might be foreclosing or limiting that imagination. These times call for a lot they call for a lot from us and from our communities. It's okay to feel a little bit of fear or uncertainty in destabilized times. People don't get through it because they're fearless. People get through these periods of time because they have the capacity to ground themselves in who they are and what they want to accomplish. 
many people here are technically proficient and can remember the way in which programming allows us to start at a command line prompt, one that is unlimited in so many ways. When we are interfacing with something that presents itself like a wissy wig, what you see is what you get, that can limit our imagination because it tells us that what is possible is what we see in front of us on the screen and nothing else. The truth is, there's so much more that we can do. What is possible is not limited by what we can see. What is possible is what we can imagine and work together to build and make possible. And it's important to remember that. It is important to remember to take initiative for protecting that imagination and protecting that field of possibility to make sure that we can build the kind of world that everybody can live in fully as a human being. We must take initiative to remain human and to see the humanity of the people that we are working with at all times. Human beings are more than their market value. We all are, each and every single one of us. It's very likely though, that we are receiving messages that tell us that we're not, that our worth, that our value is based on what can be extracted by someone who has power. When you go into the workplace, what you might be told is that you are on company time. I am asking you today to take the initiative to remember that there is no such thing as company time. It is your time. It is our time. And though our workplaces may be able to place constraints on what we do with that time, it is not theirs. It is ours. Every employment contract is one in which we are trading a bit of our time for some resources that we need to build the best quality of life for ourselves possible. That is what a workplace is. As I mentioned before, I don't work in the tech profession and I don't have any tips or tricks on how to break in. Most of my resources have been obtained through what can be best summarized as petty criminal acts. I'm a criminal. I'm a former sex worker. I'm a full spectrum doula someone who has provided care for any possible outcome of a pregnancy, including abortion, which is being challenged in our country at this time. I'm someone who's worked in harm reduction, who has been willing to access and share resources to help people pursue any positive change in their life, regardless of their sobriety and regardless of what other challenges and marginalization they may be facing. Sometimes there's been a law in my way. Never let that stop me. Our workplaces aren't going to be the places that we find the best tools for our liberation and for our full humanity. Our workplaces are the places that we find the resources that we need to do something powerful with our humanity and with our gifts. To say that it is important for us to check our privilege is a chance for us to take inventory of our proximity to power and fully consider what is possible and what can be accomplished with it. What we are facing is unique to our time and to our context, but the situation itself is not unprecedented, nor are the tools necessary to overcome it. All resistance movements have been predicated upon a population that has a consciousness of resistance built in that allows them to see a moment and act on behalf of their values and their shared humanity, to understand that the freedom of all is where we find our own freedom. Our fates are intertwined with one another. Throughout history, there have been times when people have come to power and have used it in violent and abusive ways to meet their own ends. And every time in history that this has happened, it has been met by a group of people 
not just one person who was fearless or heroic, but people who were ready and willing to act when a situation called upon them to do so. When we take initiative for our imagination, we can meet these moments with a sense of empowerment that reminds us that no matter what we're facing, we have choices before us. We are not fully condemned to subordination or submission to these unjust power structures, especially not when we take charge of our own imagination. There are people who are going to spend their lives dedicated to underground movements, many of which that we like to create the narrative of resistance or rebellion around, but they have never acted alone and they have never acted as sole actors. As I looked at the recent legislation across the United States of America, I felt overwhelmed. This is an overwhelming moment. And one of the things that I did for myself was to go and look and read at the accounts of people who survived them and gave us some tips in their story for what to do. There are some common themes that exist throughout time and space that I think are very, very relevant. People have been willing to take inventory of their potential and their power and have been willing to act from where they stood in their immediate moment. A consciousness of resistance is one that allows us to see opportunity where we might not otherwise if we didn't have that imagination. It allows us to see a moment where we can act on behalf of positive change. There's a story that goes back to World War II and to people who were resisting the Nazi power in Germany. There was an activist who was, important, who was an important part of an underground resistance movement. And on one day, he had a task ahead of him that was very important for him to accomplish. And he was stopped by a member of the Gestapo. In that moment, he had to decide what he needed to do to survive. And he made a quick improvisational choice. He looked at his surroundings and he noticed that he was standing beside a dental office. He looked at the placard on the door and he said that he was in the midst of obtaining absolutely mundane and normal dental care uh, and not up to anything in particular, certainly not an act of resistance. That officer knocked on the door of the dentist and out came a person who had never seen this individual before. They did not know each other. They did not know the roles that they played in the world. They had no reason necessarily to trust one another. And the, vigil, the individual who answered that door saw the stakes of that moment. That individual saw the potential threat, the life or death consequences that were at stake. And rather than saying she didn't know that person on the doorstep, that that wasn't an appointment on her schedule, which she could have done, instead she took that moment to say, yes, that was my patient we were doing some routine dental care. Power sometimes asks us to submit in advance before we have to. It tells us the consequences we might face if we don't act on behalf of that power, but we don't always have to. That person didn't have to know what was going on. They just had to know that there was a human being whose life was in the balance and that there was something that they could do to protect them. And they made it a point to do so. That person is not gonna be someone that we're gonna read about necessarily in history books the same way. That small act was so small, it was so incidental in the grand scheme of things, but it was very, very important. And that person might not have seen that moment and their potential to save a life without that imagination and without awareness and without that full conviction of the power they had to make a choice that affirmed the humanity of another human being. Most of what we will be doing in the coming years is going to look like that. It's not necessarily going to be the cinematic narrative of someone running into a burning building. It's going to be people who step up 
courageously like that in day-to-day -day life. There is no set of individual acts or a roadmap that I can offer. Instead, what I can say is we must work to prevent our conversion into fascism every day that we face it, that we must learn resistance as a discipline, and that we must learn it by holding our vision for the world that we want to live in firmly in mind without capitulating or making any concessions to the limitations that are offered by people who are behaving in a way that causes harm. In the wake of the Roe v. Wade decision, I've had a number of people who have emailed me asking, what do we do? How do I help? How do I show up for other people in the face of something that I know is wrong? In the interim, the battle is going to be faced primarily in helping people access the care that they need. Our short-term political goals are going to be care, and they will be love. We are going to have to work to face a very, very long battle over many years unfolding to change the politics of this moment. But that change will be made by the individual decisions of care that we make for one another. What is resistance? Resistance is, above all things, the capacity to take action. It's not an identity. You may have heard the refrain, be an accomplice, not an ally. And that's a sentence that speaks directly to the truth of action. Ally is an identity that someone can take, but it can so easily degrade into a passive form of consumption rather than the capacity to take action where one stands with the power and the proximity to power and the potential that comes with that. Resistance is the ability to act. No matter what we face, we need to ensure that we have the capacity to act, that we must act on our own behalf for our own survival and for our own liberation. It is important to set yourself to a task that is reasonable and fits within your skills, your abilities, and what you have to offer at this time. It's not necessarily something that you can aspire to. It is something that you practice every day by continuing to learn and collaborate with people. All people who are facing a certain amount of constraint or oppression need to have an occupation. An occupation is not necessarily a job. An occupation is something that one does to continue practicing a capacity to act and a capacity to see the humanity of other people and meet them fully and work with them. Very often, these things may be very simple. It may be as simple as getting to know the people in your neighborhood and hear their stories. It may be as simple as talking to the people you work with about how much money they're being paid to do the job that they're doing, or what other opportunities may better suit the vision they have for their own life. By continuing to maintain those connections, we maintain our ability to act. We maintain control of our own imagination of what is possible. When we work in the technical field, it can be very, very easy to see the tools and the technology as the solutions themselves, to believe that if we can just code the right thing, if we can just think of the right tool that we can solve the problem, the human beings are the solutions. The human beings are not the problem. When you work in technology, you have the ability to create a tool that can serve the needs of people. And Holding that in the forefront of our mind is going to make the difference in the years to come. I learned a lot in my time as a sex worker. Namely, I learned what it meant to work. There's a meme that has floated around the internet, and for those of you who haven't seen it, allow me the awkward moment to explain it to you. In this meme, there is the text, sex work is sex and sex is bad. The next panel indicates sex work is sex and sex is good. 
The next panel says, sex work is work and work is good. The final panel says, sex work is work and work is bad. What does this mean? Especially in the context of a conference that's going to tell you how to break into a workplace and how to support the people that you meet there. What this has taught me over the years is that despite whatever trappings or marketing or hype we put around our work, at the end of the day, it is a transaction for resources. It is not the assessment of who we are or our full potential. Early in the sex worker rights movement, people talked a lot about liberation or the empowering aspects of doing this work. And anyone in the erotic trades will tell you that that will pretty much fall by the wayside pretty quickly. For whatever empowerment I may have felt in the erotic trades, I have also felt a great, great amount of marginalization, opposition, violence, and general interference with my own humanity. This was never empowering to face. Stigma poses a risk to my life and to that of my family. I live in a place and a time that will never stop holding that over my head. It is something that will always be an obstacle for me to overcome when I try to break into a workplace or I try to find community with the people I live amongst. That part is not empowering. What was empowering was the fact that I could take action on my own behalf for my own survival to get the resources that I needed in order to achieve some measure of a quality of life for myself. Whether or not this is work that I would choose under different circumstances or not, it is the work that has been chosen for me or that I have at least agreed to take on. What I have always had to learn to remember though is that the work itself is not my liberation. It might be the way we keep our customers coming back for more, but when I go to work, I am going to work to obtain resources that help me pursue the goals for freedom and equality and liberation that I see. Many of our workplaces want to collapse the context of our lives into our workplace. We're told to find a job that we love, pursuing a goal that we have. That can be a distraction to what is actually going on. When you take a job or when you build a technical tool, bear in mind that you are in an exchange with an employer. It may not always be possible to do the job that you love the most or to find a career that affirms your heart and soul. Oftentimes, it's going to be a compromise. It's going to be something that we can at least approve of on some level that we can do that we feel is not totally in violation of our beliefs and our own humanity. When an employer tells you that they are representing freedom or liberation, what you're probably seeing is marketing copy. And it's important to remember that because when our workplaces tell us that working for their agenda and the outcomes they wanna see are equivalent to our own freedoms and liberation, we've sold ourselves short and we've cut ourselves off from what is possible. Work is work and work is what lets us access resources. Proximity to privilege and to power in many ways governs the choices that we can make. Some people are going to have to take the job that is offered for them because that's what's necessary for them to continue surviving. Other people might have more choices that allow them to pick projects or to work to build tools that they can really stand behind. If you are faced with a workplace that is doing something that you don't believe in, but you know that you don't have the full freedom to take another job right now. You always have the option to be a bad worker. That's right. 
I'm giving you permission to be a bad worker. It's okay to work slowly because this is your time, not theirs. It is okay to interfere or to perhaps work against the tools that you believe might cost somebody else their life or their humanity. You do not have to submit to the demands in advance. As Roe v. Wade affects the way legislation looks across this country, we've seen a number of places that are directing their efforts and their work towards the very letter of the law rather than the beliefs that they have. They look at the law and they see what their possible viability is for breaking it. And they act in advance of any direct command or request to cause harm to somebody. You do not always have to do this. You do not have to report somebody in advance if you don't have to. You don't have to look for the ways in which the people accessing your service or your tools might be in direct violation of the black and white text. You can make the choice to act as an accomplice when someone is using those tools in a way that perhaps your employer doesn't care for. I have a story I would like to tell you about technology and various tools that we use online. The year was 2004 and I was a very young up and coming queer person. I was home from college and I was looking forward to an opportunity to meet someone else who like me was young and queer. I went to a website called Craigslist and I clicked on a link called Casual Encounters. I looked through all those postings in a much older form of the internet that didn't have the pictures and certainly not the video. It was just text from people who were looking for other people. In all that content, I found a listing from somebody that seemed like a person I might want to get to know. Like me, they were a queer woman. They were a self-identified letter dyke and I liked the cut of their jib. I sent them a message, they sent one back, and soon enough we were on the phone. We set a date and we went to go see a movie together. Now, to set the scene, we all have the classic vision of a couple on a date going to see perhaps a horror film and snuggling in close, letting the tension of what was happening on screen be a justification to hold and be near each other. We were watching Natalie Portman on the screen and screen. We were watching Natalie Portman on the screen and almost like a horror film, we were crawling into one of another's arms at the sheer intensity of what we were watching and how much it was impacting us. We were connecting based on our desire, not just for who was on the screen, but for one another. We enjoyed the movie, we enjoyed our time together, and we decided to talk longer into the night. It was in that conversation that my new friend told me that she was off to go and participate in an event and a protest called Camp Trans. I responded rather ignorantly, what's Camp Trans? Which did not impress my date very much. She followed that up very patiently to unburden me of my ignorance with some more information. She told me that it was a protest outside of the Women's Michigan Women's Festival and that it was based on the the policies at the door that deliberately and explicitly excluded transgender women. It was because that we met that night that I was able to become a better, more informed person who was more aware of injustice and what people were doing about it. And it might be easy to say that that meeting was facilitated by Craigslist, that without Craigslist, I would not have had that moment that I need to credit this form of a technical tool for what happened. When I take full inventory of myself, however, and I think of that night, I remember that it was not the tool, it was my desire. It was the desire of the person that I was meeting. It was the fact that we were two humans who wanted to find one another, 
to establish some form of intimacy and connection. Craigslist was the tool that mediated it, but it could have been so many things. It could have been the back of a magazine or a newspaper from the alternative press. It could have been a bar. It could have been a hangout. It could have been through friends, but what mattered was we felt our desire was worthy of action. That what made us feel pleasure was something that could help us become the people that we were. Without remembering that it was desire that brought us together, it can be easy to say that it was the tool itself and that what we need are more tools that are like Craigslist. What we have to remember is that those tools were facilitating our needs. And it was our needs that were centered. When you're building a technical tool and you're working in technology, remember that it is the desire and the needs of the humans that come first. Don't center the technology itself. When we center technology as our salvation or as the end all be all of our community and our networking, we are in many ways asking people to conform to the needs of the technology and the tools. It must always be the other way around. And that means really looking at ourselves and remembering that who we are and what we want and what we desire is important. That the tools that we make need to serve the people who use them, not the other way around. Hello and good morning. Thank you so much for watching my video. I wanted, since we were starting so bright and early, to get away from just this, uh, this little uh, backdrop that I have, which is imperfectly tacked up in front of a very messy room. Uh, so, but I'm happy to come live and I wanted to talk a little bit about the tool uh, that probably brought me in the room today and is, uh, giving me a lot of things to do lately. And uh, that was the fact that I went to a technology conference and I uh, was demonstrating an abortion tool. And I wanna show you that briefly. It's something that I'm going to be showing people at the Las Vegas event in August, up close and in person. So I hope that you'll be there so that I can actually really break it down step by step. But just to do a quick drive by, this is a manual vacuum aspirator. This is something that is mass produced and used around the world uh, so that um, abortion services can take place. It's an abortion tool. And this is a jar with tubes and a cannula and a syringe. And it does the same thing. So it's, it's, an, improv it's an improvised um, abortion tool. And it was something that I was really happy to show people uh, to remind them that even though we have a certain amount of legislation, uh, even though we have a deficit of clinical resources, that uh, the picture is, is so much bigger. And the more that we understand this technology, the more we can understand what we need to protect with the law, and the better we can refer people who need this care if we don't really have a full comprehensive understanding of abortion, it can it feel really, really, really overwhelming and it can be hard to direct people to the right resources. I also wanna talk about the importance of solidarity and using language. I am someone who identifies as a woman. I am someone who identifies as a mother and that's the language that describes my experience um, with reproduction and reproductive technologies. When I'm talking about reproductive technology as a whole, however, my experience is not the end all be all. There are so many people for so many reasons who use reproductive technologies and for so many different purposes that if I just specifically frame everything with my experience or if I uh, frame it only within uh, one particular group with one particular use, I'm not really taking in the whole big picture and it's impossible to have full solidarity. So I, I really hope that as the conversation about Roe v. Wade and abortion access uh, continues as it will for many years, that 
we can all remember that and take that step to remember that we have an experience within a big, big moment in time. Uh, and we need to keep thinking about the just unlimited diversity of the human experience and all the ways that laws, um, bad laws can shut people out. Uh, but when I was building this tool and as I began to share it, I had to look back upon my whole long, uh, <laughs> longer by the day career within reproductive rights activism. And imagination stood out to me. Uh, it really stood out to me because I got into this movement as a teenager and it, it happened almost on accident. I was on a high school trip to Washington, D.C., like a lot of high schoolers do or a lot of tourists. It's, it's a place to see for sure. It's our nation's capital. And just by sheer coincidence, that trip was scheduled for what was the 30th anniversary of Roe v. Wade in, in 2003. And I was standing on the steps of the Supreme Court and I looked out at just the whole, uh, the whole open space before me. And it was full of people, more people than I had ever seen in one place before in my life. And the number of people there to protest didn't just extend from the steps of the Supreme Court to the White House building. It went clear on back to the Washington Monument. And the whole time I was in the city for that whole uh, week, I could see groups of people who were there representing that big mass. And they were... Uh, uh, there to explicitly to ha uh, protest Roe v. Wade. They were overwhelmingly about 95% probably uh, pro-life protesters. And in that moment, I, I was alarmed and I, I felt quite certain that within my lifetime, I was going to see Roe v. Wade fall, uh, purely because I could see the power of the imagination of the people in front of me. Uh, despite the fact that a lot of us thought it was a simple fact, something that we could take for granted, that Roe v. Wade existed, that it was it was protected, uh, that it was settled law, uh, there were a lot of people who were imagining a very, very, very different future. And they didn't limit their imagination at all. They knew what their goal was, and they were working together very, very hard to make that happen. And they utilized a wide diversity of tactics. So I understood that uh, it was important for me not to just imagine the existence of this one law um, or this one case law, uh, but to also just to imagine that I needed to have uh, something just as big, if not bigger in my mind when I would do my activist work. I had to remember that I didn't just want one law that protected reproductive rights, that I wanted there to be reproductive access for all people, that, uh, that I would occupy a world where people had bodily autonomy, where they could make the decisions that they needed to make to achieve the vision they had for their own life. And I, I really wanted to have a big imagination um, so that I could be the best activist I could be. And I, I've done a lot of different things. Uh, one of the uh, positions that I hold is that of a full spectrum doula. Uh, doula is a term that is somewhat contested uh, within my field, and that's because it goes back to ancient Greek, and it refers to an individual who was um, a servant or in um, the slave class system who would assist with birth with the basically the most practical basic aspects. They provided emotional and practical support to someone who was in labor. Uh, they helped do the cleanup work. Uh, they did the, the messy stuff, the hands-on the hands-on work. And uh, as uh, the work of doulas started to get bigger, uh, it really became focused, you know, primarily and very directly to assist people in labor and delivery. And the full spectrum doula movement kind of emerged to say that that's one experience and it's a very important experience, but there are so many other possible reproductive outcomes. And there is no, um, no one who should ever have to go through any of those alone or face all of the bureaucratic hurdles, um, you know, that, that, that can, you know, just really make a process more difficult than it needs to be. They shouldn't have to face that alone. And it was also because the, uh, the doula uh, kind of field was full of people who also had a lot of 
anti-abortion uh, positions and ideologies. Uh, that was, you know, it was kind of in many ways unquestioned that it just existed, that anyone who called themselves a doula would, of course, be uh, opposed to abortion because you care so much about um, babies. And uh, I do, I do care about babies very, very much. Uh, but that was something that uh, myself and many other people who shared my beliefs realized we couldn't allow to go uncontested. Uh, but that was also a form of activism that was rooted in care. And because I was providing direct care, I was always having to engage uh, with the different types of legal landscapes that I was facing. And it just kept broadening and broadening and broadening my perspective over the years uh, in terms of what it meant for me to take action on my beliefs and what I thought was going to be necessary for us to imagine. Uh, so solidarity work is really important because we're not just looking at single issue problems right now. Um, that solidarity is what also allows me to see uh, the, the huge number, this huge increase of anti-LGBTQ legislation. And, and in this case, it really is, the whole umbrella is under attack in so many ways in terms of books we can read about, to read about queer experiences. It's access to gender affirming care for people who are transgender or gender non-conforming. Um, it has so many, so many different manifestations. And I, I don't think I would ever really have the full imagination to foresee it without having uh, done direct work with people and and really seen uh, gotten into the belly of the beast. It's also reminded me that um, you know something has to be fully accessible to everybody, and and that's where the 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 goal has to be. And so I've also done some work within the criminal justice system to support people who are incarcerated um, with uh, their reproductive health, and that has been to help support birth um, behind bars that has also been to help advocate on behalf of people who um, may be wanting to access abortion or also to uh, to be aware of the way that the, the prison justice system makes decisions about reproduction for people in terms of involuntary sterilization um, and the like, uh, that that is all under the purview of reproductive justice. Uh, reproductive justice is also a movement that I, you know, I really encourage everyone to look into. Uh, reproductive justice is something that came out of 90s activism uh, among uh, women of color. And it was, it really came out of a group called Sister Song. And that was about, in many ways, having a bigger imagination for what the reproductive rights movement could do. Uh, it looked at uh, rights as kind of a, a very limiting uh, way to look at things. Um, in terms of is abortion legal or illegal, uh, that's certainly one part. And those, those laws are, are really important for us to look at. And having legal access to abortion is very important. But reproductive justice really looks at the whole person and, and what they're facing and their ability to uh, not just have an abortion, but also to have a child and have that child be raised in a safe and affirming world. Um, it is it's about the right to to have that, you know, family on your own terms in safe ways um, or to have access to uh, reproductive health um, as necessary. And it's also about including the right to having um, primary sexual pleasure um, in encounters that um, someone's pleasure matters, that someone's desire matters, um, looking at issues of, of consent and um and, and education and full resources. And the more I was exposed to that, the, uh, the more I learned and, and the more I grew. Uh, so I, I, that's something that I definitely want to look into. Uh, but I do, I do get a lot of people who um, have been emailing me and they, they've wanted to know more about this. And, and I'm always happy to, to share that knowledge that I have. What I don't want people to do is think that they have to walk away from this and know how to go out and perform abortions or that I'm recruiting people to go out and perform abortions or that it's necessary for everybody to know how, how to do this. And, and that's not the case. I think knowing how it works on a theoretical level uh, is going to help make you more informed. 
uh, but it's not necessarily a full on skill that everyone has to to develop. So, uh, you know, if you're thinking about emailing me or this is something that you want to learn more about, um, you know, keep that in mind that yeah, I'm happy to show people, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be qualified to do so. And it doesn't mean that you absolutely have to do so. Uh, I think the most important thing that we can do is hold on to our hearts and hold on to our heads uh, because we're going to face a very dizzying array of, of news and information that is going to be very overwhelming to confront. And if we're all trying to remember like a bullet point list of things to do, the number of things on that list is just going to be way too many to consider at all times. Uh, but if you can come back to um, having your heart and having your head in line with with what you believe and who you are and how important it is that you are who you are, you're going to be able to face, you know, um, unforeseen situations with a great deal of wisdom. And uh, and then that's that's so important. That is so important. It's, you know, people very often point out that the first thing that a dictator or an abusive political ruler does when they come into power is to begin to limit the press or the media. And that's true. It's, it's a very practical thing for them to do to be in charge of the information that goes out. Uh, but also the part of that is really is that it's about trying to be in charge of people's imaginations and try to limit that so that people start to think this is all that there is. This is all that there ever was. And this is all that there ever will be. And so I need to make my choices um, within this system. And if that's what we're left with, it can be very, very easy to come back to a fuck you got mine position because that's what scarcity can do. It can really scare us into that kind of a place uh, because we think that the only choice that we can make is one that comes at the expense of somebody else because it's us versus them at all times. And, uh, and that's, that's not true. That's not true. We're not outnumbered, um, but we are we are out imagined in many ways, and maintaining that full imagination uh, is going to be the most important thing you can do more than any given thing that you can read or any given skill that you can master. Because you're going to learn and master so many skills that comes from curiosity, and that's a beautiful curiosity. Um, but remembering to always work with tools or build tools with a full imagination will help you build so much more and do so many more things with the tools that are available. Uh, as I come to a close, I, I want to offer so much thanks to the people behind the scenes who made this possible because I'm here in, in so many ways because people were acting in solidarity in ways that I am deeply grateful for. Um, it's, uh, I'm sometimes an unconventional choice for a speaker. I'm a little bit eccentric. Uh, I have some, you know, some very, you know, fringe beliefs in many ways. Um, and so people were acting in solidarity when they listened to me and they, they have given me this opportunity to speak with you. Um, and, and thank you to all of them. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here. And, and thank you to those who are watching for the gift of your time that you have given me to consider things like these. Uh, I, I really hope that they're not just going to be empty platitudes. I, I really hope that you will walk away and understand how much I love your imagination and what it can do and how much I love that you are here and that you are doing the things that you are doing. Uh, it definitely, it, it's definitely an honor to be around so many people who have such open hearts and such open minds who are thinking of a beautiful world that we can all live in. And uh, as we come to this, yeah, this close, um, we have, you know, so many sponsors who have made things happen um, that are really, really great. And uh, I, I want to be here throughout this conference to answer any questions that you have. Uh, I don't necessarily think I'll take a Q&A right here at this moment, but I am going to be available on all of the back channels. I am so excited to see everybody who's able to make it out to Las Vegas. Um, I'm ordering all my favorite masks. Um, I hope you are too, uh, so that we can be there and that I can show you this one little tool and this um, one little little bit that I have to offer. Uh, and please feel free to message me. I, I am available on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Ms. Maggie Mayhem. You can drop me an email, maggie at maggiemayhem.com. You can visit my website and... Um, 
with that, I think we're going to start flipping over to a, to a transitional um, sponsor slide. And thank you so much for having me here today. Please hold on to your heads as, as things get to be more scarce and a little bit more troubling. Awesome. It was great having you here with us today, Maggie, and thank you for opening off our Take the Initiative uh, TDI conference today. Really looking forward for anyone who's going to be in Vegas uh, interacting and seeing you in person. And uh, for everyone else, yeah, the conference goes on. Thanks again, Maggie, for joining us.